it's really an honor to be here, an honor and a distinct pleasure. I have uh, admired uh, Wycliffe Hall and the theology and witness that has emerged in this place and from it. And I am grateful to contribute in some way to the work that we have here and to be a part of this distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, today, I, I want to reflect with you some about theophany and in the book of Exodus, as uh, Steve has wonderfully introduced us to, uh, but also think about Holy Scripture itself as a form of theophany, uh, uh, perhaps one of the central forms of divine manifestation in the world. So I begin with a theophany in Exodus 16. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I suppose the problems of theophany are well known, perhaps all too well known. So numerous are they, I will entertain only a few of them here, that it seems truly as if theophanies are strictly speaking impossible. Yet Holy Scripture speaks plainly of the divine appearance in the created order. And our text from Exodus is only one of very many. The Hebrew text and the Septuagint translation are very firm. God is seen. The root verb ra is simply the ordinary word for sight. And the Septuagint makes plain that this is a visual appearance by the Lord God, a literal ophony, a seeing. We might take the entire book of Exodus in truth as one long theophany, an appearance of almighty God to Israel in cloud and fire throughout the liberation of the enslaved and their long wanderings in the wilderness. Holy Writ is, is replete with special divine appearances from the sagas of the patriarchs and matriarchs in Genesis through the extraordinary gifts of sight to the prophets, but nowhere is the theophany more urgent, more tactile, more luminous than in the books of the wilderness, if we may style them so, Exodus and Numbers, and in extended fashion, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. The exceeding weight of glory appears in cloud and fire throughout the wilderness campaign, flashing in volcanic power and holy scorching through a people consecrated to the Lord. It is of course of God's own sovereign election that the waste places are chosen for God's own manifestation. But in a creaturely sense, Perhaps we could say that there is something about the wilderness, its barren expanse, its shimmering aridity and heat, its austerity that makes the entirely fitting there. Let me just note here the conjoining of divine election and creaturely fittingness. It will figure prominently at a later date. So strong is this tie that we might say that the sanctified dwelling place, the altar of the theophany just is the wilderness. The people Israel in our text from Exodus need only look toward the wilderness 
to receive in magnetic power the fiery presence of their liberator in the cloud, high above the heads of Moses and Aaron. Nothing in Israel's scriptures compares to the wilderness books for direct divine appearing. These are the dynamic centerpieces of God's explosive manifestation to the covenant people. In these books are the fiery presence of the Lord God in a thorn bush that will not be consumed by divine glory. In them, the pillar of fire that rests upon the house of Israel by night and its cloudy luminous haze by day. In these books, the cloud stands guard before the tent of meeting and travels with the tabernacle as it moves station by station to the land of promise. Here we see the fiery presence of God scorch the earth and swallow whole the rebellious. Here the voracious fire who is God combusts the first sacrifice of Moses in the temple and destroys the sons of Aaron, the bearers of alien fire. And here the censers of the rebellious are smelted down by divine fire into the sacred plating for the Ark of the Covenant. The wilderness sees and endures the smoking fire that is the glorious God. So we must speak of theophanies if we are to say anything at all about God and his way with his own dear people, the covenant people of Israel. Yet it seems we cannot, or perhaps to put this better, we cannot win through to the concepts that will permit us to say what we must. Let me rehearse just a few of these difficulties, examples that have been long felt and deeply puzzled over by St. Augustine in his great work on Theophany de Trinitate and in the tradition well beyond him. Perhaps at the outset, and at base, we may find it conceptually impossible to say how God could be present in any way in his cosmos. God is not creature, and that in most definite radical form. We might say that the very definition of an idol is that it can appear can be present in the creaturely realm without hesitation and without struggle. The idol is available, we might say. It can be held and possessed and reverenced palpably, visually, even materially within our realm of the spatial and temporal. The true God cannot. In the great theophany, the primal divine appearing on Mount Sinai, the Lord God tells Israel that it must not worship or bow down to any likeness, any graven image, any form of anything heavenly or earthly or exhibited in the watery chaos. For the Lord God is a jealous God who will not abide desecration of his imageless holiness. To violate this commandment is to enter paganism, the persistent temptation of Israel and of all Christians. This profound and iconic foundation of the Decalogue has left Christian theology with a conceptual impasse in its understanding of theophany. It seems that God must be conceived as the one who is beyond appearing and who must be defined as that which cannot inhabit the creaturely realm, but is rather that which transcends it utterly, implacably. The creature is material, the creator immaterial. The creature is temporal, the creator atemporal, or as a near synonym, eternal. 
The creature is finite, the creator infinite. And as Austin Ferrer seemed to suggest, the infinite is radically incommensurate with the finite. Indeed, incommensurability, the lack of common measure between two things seems prima facie to rule out theophany. Thinking along these lines has made some historians of religion believe that the Pentateuch represented something they called a primitive view of deity, a kind of plastic representation that could only suggest a magical or corporeal vision of God. An ascending ladder of refinement to the concept of God led these primitives from such plastic and tactile images to a higher conception of a God supreme over all gods, a henotheism, this was called, to a final sophisticated and exalted conception of the transcendent God, the true monotheism of the major prophets. We heard a wonderful summary of this development in Stephen's paper. The very idea of the magical, the fetishistic, that dominated the early anthropology of Edward Tyler and James George Frazier, and in a different key of William Robertson Smith, moved out and above from the visible to the sublimated, from the animal to the imageless, from the numinous and tremendum to the properly holy and transcendent. In such a world, the theophany disappears in the higher religions, replaced by a transcendence worthy of the name God. Of course, it would be easy to think that this entire problematic belongs to the rarefied world of the modernists, especially the architects of the higher critical Hyosgushitku. But we would not travel far in the school of St. Augustine if we allowed ourselves such an anachronism. In his work on the Trinity, Augustine registers with striking plainness the difficulty Theophany makes for his doctrine of God. The early sections of that magisterial work were written under the strongest impress of Plotinus on Augustine's thought. And it is here Augustine treats most directly the notion of God's appearing to his creatures. Almighty God is the sublime and transcendent one, not the many, and he is ineffable, utterly sovereign, simple, ideal truth and transcendental goodness. Such a God does not inhabit the creaturely realm, but is beyond, always beyond. For this reason, Augustine speculates that the theophanies of the Old Testament are instances of the holy God making use of a creature in order to appear in our realm. The Lord adopts for his own vehicle the elements of fire or air or sound to make himself known to the Israelites. The immaterial one is rendered material by a creaturely reality that can signify the divine presence. Thus is born two central ideas for Augustine's thought, the very notion of mediation and the central task of signifying. Almighty God can select a creature, a winged bird, a stretch of cloudy sky, a silken vibration of creaturely air, a plume of ascending flame to convey his reality. They don't have to. <laughs> Okay, this was the wrong reading of Augustine. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I, I will take further instruction. 
<laughs> yours or Randy yours? Really yours, yes, okay. Uh, let's see, where were we there? Um, my my um, poor summary of Augustine's thought, the notion of mediation and the task of signifying. All right, so there we were, um, the plume of ascending flame to convey his reality and instruction to the creature. God himself is not seen. Augustine is firm about this. No one looks upon God and lives, not even the meekest of men, the prophet Moses. The frank depictions of direct sight in Israel's scriptures granted to the prophets or shared among the elders of the people in the covenant feast in Exodus 24 are simply created images made use of by the hidden God to make himself vivid on the earth. But immediately we see the problem that Augustine has already set for himself. The indirectness and finitude of the creature caught up in the divine self-disclosure makes it uncertain whether the theophany is rightly understood as mediation or as sign. In De Doctrina Christiana, Augustine suggests the distinction between things and signs, a rich distinction that will bear lasting fruit in the conceptuality of Latin theology. The creator God makes things. The objects in our world are the direct effect of the divine willing. But creatures are not exhausted by their being things. Creatures can also signify. They can point to another reality and they can represent it. Thus, election and a creature fit for service as sign are joined. We might think of two celebrated instances from Israel's scriptures as theophanous signs. The bow in the sky as a sign of the covenant and the Sabbath itself, the sign of the creator, now at rest from his majestic work. For Augustine the Redder, however, words are the principal signs. Their metaphysical reality is exhausted and signifying. Words simply are signs and they represent an inner word, the human thought. In this way, also fatal, Augustine twins representation and signification. So in God's gracious providence, things can also become signs. The world can become the theater of God's glory and the creatures in it point to and represent the God who made them. In one of the most famous sections of the confessions, Augustine ventriloquizes the elements of the earth who speak to the faithful heart. I asked the whole frame of the world about my God, Augustine writes. And it answered me, I am not he, but he made me. This is that famous section in book six. Here the entire cosmos points away from itself to the creator. And in this way is fashioned into a complex and integrated sign of the unseen origin of all that is. So we may well ask, is a theophany understood as a creature employed by the transcendent God simply another sign, a thing pointing to the one who made it? Note now the conceptual puzzle Augustine has bequeathed to the very notion of theophany. If the world and all its elements can serve as sign, how can there be particular signs that represent the unseen God? If everything is sign, how any singular thing can be a sign set apart and known as God's bearer and representative is a puzzle. 
This in the idiom of signification is the riddle of divine omnipresence to the created order. Almighty God is everywhere in his cosmos, sustaining and ordering and governing the whole. His presence is not subject to quantity or extension. There is not more God in a vast space than in the most obscure and minute. This is the stringent demand of divine immateriality on our concept of God's manifestation to creatures. God cannot be located or placed under the dimensions of created space. Indiscriminately, lavishly, he upholds the entire cosmos and each creature within it universally, uniformly, unstintingly. It seems then that no particular creature could be picked out as a sign of the providential God. For everything, indeed in its very being, speaks that sign. I am not God, rather, he made me. We might say in a more Kantian fashion, is there in truth only one theophany, the creation itself? In this way, St. Augustine places before us in compressed idiom, the demanding relation of providence and creation to the Lord's election and redeeming will. So we might turn to the notion of mediation as opposed to sign. Is theophany better understood as a mediation of divine presence? Has the sign become something more than a representative of God's inner word and now assumed a distinct task to assume and mediate the transcendent in the creaturely realm. Is theophany not simply appearing, that is, but also presence and making present? Has the unseen one taken a thing within the cosmos to make himself felt? Has he drawn a creature so closely into his own being that the creature now conveys the power, the mystery, the nature of the invisible one? Is this theophany, God visible, to borrow Irenaeus's haunting phrase? The earlier section of the celebrated book six of the Confessions might make us think so. There in luminous prose, given suitable Victorian lushness in Pusey's ornate translation, Augustine writes, but what do I love when I love thee? Not beauty of bodies, nor the fair harmony of time, nor the brightness of the light so gladsome to our eyes, nor sweet melodies of varied songs, nor the fragrant smell of flowers and ointments and spices, not manna and honey, not limbs acceptable to embracements of flesh. None of these I love when I love my God. And yet I love a kind of light and melody and fragrance and meat and embracement when I love my God. The light, melody, fragrance, meat, embracement of my inner man, where there shineth unto my soul what space cannot contain, and there soundeth what time beareth not away, and there smelleth what breathing disperseth not, and there tasteth what eating diminisheth not, and there clingeth what satiety divorceth not. This it is which I love when I love my God. Pusey is great, isn't he? <laughs> a, a kind of light and melody and fragrance and meat. In that phrase is caught up the entire riddle of theophany. We might under the impress of Augustine's reflections here, consider the burning bush, the pillar of cloud and fire, 
the glory of the distant cloud, the volcanic fire of Sinai, to be mediations of divine glory, the weighty kabod of God's majestic being. Christians will turn immediately from these wilderness theophanies to the idea of the sacraments, the material of the universe being set apart as mediators of the grace who is God. The Eucharist in the memorable words of the Anglican 39 articles are signs, certainly, but effective or effectual signs, giving what they signify. The sacraments appear to be symbols in Paul Tillich's technical sense. They participate in the very reality they represent. A creature can be so closely entwined with its creator, so adopted into his nearer presence, that it can convey to its beholder not simply instruction, not simply a voice or teaching, but rather a nature, a being that cannot be seen or handled or contained by a creature or creaturely realm. A theophany in this sense would be an exemplar of what Karl Rahner called mediated immediacy, an indirectness that nevertheless gave what it stood for. Or to borrow the exceedingly Augustinian definition of sacraments, one not in good favor among sacramental theologians these days, a theophany might be an outward and visible sign of an inner and spiritual grace given by Christ as sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. This notion of means is a form of mediation. It conveys the reality which it bears. If theophany is mediation, God is present and his saving grace effective in the wilderness wanderings of the people Israel and in the calling and office of the prophet and priest Moses. Now, all this seems very right, very fitting. Surely the manifestation in cloud and fire to the elect people is more than simply instruction, more than a pointer to the God who is ever beyond. It seems entirely appropriate to the singular nature of the eternal covenant that God would come to his people, really come to them as healing fire and not simply visit them as teacher and commanding voice. God is both mystery and commandment in Leo Beck's fine phrase. And such a God we may well think must be palpably manifest in the very heart of the people, dwelling among them, the holy God in the midst of a holy people. Reasoning along these lines led Calvin to speak of Israel as the church, the assembly that possesses the sacraments, though perhaps only in shadow, and the promises and the mighty works of salvation God is present as saving fire, manifest in Israel's midst. The volcanic smoke and fire of Sinai is not simply the creature out of which a commanding voice will speak, nor is the cloud in which Moses disappears simply the protective garment of the divine glory so that Israel and their prophet will survive this giving of Torah. No, it seems right to say that far more is underway in the encounter of Israel with its God. The command, know the Lord, is much more than instruction about God. It is rather the searing and healing manifestation of almighty God to the liberated refugees from Egypt, the eruption of the saving God into his creation. For this reason alone, in the midst of many others, 
The Old Testament is holy scripture, the gospel of God's salvation. All this is just right. And it seems that theophany must be simply defined in these terms as sign, but also and principally mediation. But as Christians, we must register to our last and deepest riddle about the theophany of the old covenant. For in our exaltation of the wilderness manifestations, it does not appear definite or clear to us how such a mediation differs from the incarnation of our Lord Christ or to the outpouring of his spirit. The wonderfully clear scholastic distinction, perhaps an overly bright line between the triune processions, eternal and inward to God's triune being and the missions sent in fullness of time to our earth now seems occluded, perhaps vanished altogether. It seems that the theophanies of ancient Israel are of the same kind as the tongues of flame resting on the apostles and the God bearer in the upper room, or perhaps even of the man Jesus, a creature who is also divine son, Emmanuel, God with us. Could not the human nature of Christ be taken up in just the same way as was the earthly cloud or humble thorn bush to convey God's presence to the creature? Could not Christ himself be a kind of theophany? That is perhaps of a pure and exalted kind, but a member of a kind all the same. Even as Christ is mediator and the spirit, the inner teacher, so it seems are the fiery voice and presence of almighty God to Israel, both sacraments and presence of the living God. The modern era in Christology has not worried over much about a puzzle of this kind. The assimilation of Christ to other mediations or of Christ to other creatures deified has not struck some modern theologians as a conceptual problem that eats at the heart of Christology. For Schleiermacher, Christ is the perfect and cloudless exemplar of the human creature, utterly given over to the awareness of God. For Rahner, Christ just is the completion of the self-giving of God that is the purpose and destiny of all creation. So it may be that for some schools of Christology, the very notion of theophany might be expanded or properly defined to include within its ranks the incarnation of the eternal son and the bestowal of the spirit at Pentecost. For some modernists then, the missions of son and spirit are simply agreed to be theophanies, though the best ones. And I think we might identify an entire school within modern theology by its openness to Christology and pneumatology as continuations of spiritual dynamics within creation itself, continuations in kind that reach their perfection in these New Testament events. Certainly this solves our final worry about the theophanies of Israel's scriptures. But this I suppose we might call an answer that solves a problem by declaring it solved. We need not worry over the distinction between theophany and incarnation, this school says, because we discover no need for the distinction in the first place or in the end at all. Now there's much to admire in this modernist school, much that integrates Christ deep within creaturehood and within the covenant people. And yet to dissolve the riddle of theophany in this fashion seems to me to violate a, 
an ancient and powerful instinct in the faith itself. Christology and pneumatology, the temporal missions of the eternal son and spirit cannot simply be more of the same. These events are the remaking of the world. The sheer novelty of the birth of the eternal son or the gift of his spirit cannot be set aside or diminished as a matter of degree. The incarnation in particular has been taken by most Christians to be unique, utterly strongly unique a coming of almighty God in the flesh that brooks no rival. Christ is himself in his person, savior. He tabernacles with his people, now in his own flesh, his sacred body that is the communication of his saving glory to the sin sick world. Indeed, we might say that the very notion of theophany appears to serve the purpose of marking off the appearances of almighty God to creation before and apart from the incarnation of the eternal son. Theophanies in this sense simply are what the incarnation is not. They are ante et extra Christum natum. We might put this in another way one anchored more firmly in the history of dogma, the personal or hypostatic union of the humanity of Christ with his deity is the definition of what a theophany is not. The taking as his very own, the creature of flesh and blood into his own personal and eternal reality. Theophanies on this account show God reaching down to make use of a creature for a season and a time, to wield it as an instrument of his own glory, but then leave it off again so that it returns to common use, a thorn bush in the desert, a cloud in a crisp Mediterranean sky, a flame to light and to warm a desert night. Christ's flesh, however, is never left off, never an autonomous creature at all, never a mere instrument for a time and then return to ordinary life. The humanity of Christ, we might say, is never a creature as we are, a relatively independent thing in Augustine's terms that might belong in a catalog of created objects, which sojourns for a time in our created sphere. No, the human reality of Christ is the direct effect of the mission of the eternal son, created in the spirit for his own coming, the immediate clothing of the son in visibility. Christ's flesh is the material presence of the eternal son. Or in Richard Cross's scholastic idiom, the humanity of Christ lacks metaphysical independence. And in this sense cannot be a thing at all. Now this highly Cyrillian account of Christ's mediated presence cannot solve all problems of theophany. Though to be frank, I wish it could but we can immediately see that pneumatology is not properly accounted for here, nor has the matter of mediation been thoroughly distinguished and understood in light of Israel's mediating signs. Yet it seems to me that Christ's unique mediation lays the proper foundation for a vital doctrine of almighty God's healing presence to creation the theophany of God's own goodness. This foundation should allow a different kind of structure to be built on Israel's generous land. One that accepts the full theophanies to Israel as mediation and sign, and that brings it into the spiritual life of Jew and Gentile 
brought into communion with the living God. This existence of things such that they can be taken up into the self testimony of almighty God. Let me try that sentence again. This existence of things uh, such is such that they can be taken up into the self testimony of almighty God. It is the relative autonomy of objects of the wilderness, the fire and cloud, the wind and earthquake, the sheer silence or small voice, the radiant arc of color in the rainy sunlit sky, the scrub brush lining the vast desert reaches, is that that allows the creator to seize them for his own sovereign purpose. Just so I want to suggest the material fact of the book and its cultural weight as artifact of language and of writing allows this creature too to be designated by God's gracious command to be the site of God's own appearing. Notice now how Holy Scripture properly resists being collapsed into Christology. In the modern era, it has been frequently proposed that the Bible should be viewed as a form of Chalcedonian Christology. Like its architect, it is said, Holy Writ is both human and divine, and neither its creaturehood nor its deity are to be confused or separated, mixed or divided. This analogy, if that's how we are to understand this suggestion, has proved magnetic to the churches of the Magisterial Reformation as scripture has been characterized as the gracious and commanding word of God, even as Christ is himself the very word of the Father uttered into history. And it is not without its Catholic defenders either. Indeed, we may take the great constitution on sacred revelation in Vatican II, Dei Verbum, as a meditation on the Christological form of scripture with extensions into sacramental and liturgical practice as well. Although this pattern possesses undeniable attractions, it says in the end, too much. Even as impanation says too much about the Holy Spirit's presence in the Eucharist, so Christology says too much about the Bible as creature of the living God. The species of the Eucharist, the bread and wine do not become the personal and eternal possession of the Holy Spirit, nor I would say do the words and pages and covenant histories of the Bible become the hypostatic possession of the eternal son of God. It is not that Almighty God could not incarnate in a book. I would not dare to hazard such a stricture. But it is a testimony to the strong uniqueness of the incarnation that only one creature is the personal assumption of the Son, the human flesh of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Savior, not Holy Scripture. Yet Holy Scripture is theophany, the creaturely mediation of God's saving presence and command to his creatures. Just so we must say that the very proper creatureliness of the Bible, its relative autonomy, makes it different in kind from the human nature of our Lord. Without the mission of the eternal son, the humanity of Christ could not exist. But without the sending of the son and spirit, the book of the old and new covenant could exist, though its witness of course would be false. When we describe the Bible as literature after all, we convey just this sheerly creaturely and secular status to a sacred text. The unique character and stature of Holy Writ 
demands a fresh category for its existence, one distinct from the irreplaceable and inimitable category of the Chalcedonian unity of divine and human natures in the one Christ. Only Jesus Christ is creature and creator, one God in flesh. The category I have suggested is the Holy Bible as theophany of almighty God. Indeed, the consummate theophany of Holy Scripture itself. Here, the resonance and replication of the content of the book to its status as a whole is just right. Even as Holy Scripture relates to the will of Almighty God to seize a creature and to make the divine will and being known and felt, so the Bible as a whole just is the creature who teaches the reader about the reality of God and who teaches that in its pages, God can be found there. And the twin orders are in right sequence too. As in the Ordo Ascendi, the Bible is theophany just because God has manifested himself in Israel and its prophets and inspired its writers. So in the Ordo Cognizendi, the theophanies of Israel are known just because God has seized this book to disclose and present his own mystery to creation. Just this is scripture's proper primacy and authority. The Bible is the creature which serves God's self-disclosure. Even more, it is the creature which is the mediator of God's self-presence to those who read and hear its words. The Bible then is hallowed for this use. It is holy scripture. And the Bible serves the end that is the glory of every theophany to make the creature know the Lord. So the manna taught the Israelites in the wilderness, murmuring against the prophet of the Lord. When they looked toward the wilderness, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud and the murmurers were given the bread of angels, food enough. This is what Holy Writ gives us time and again, unstinting and unbound, meat in the evening and bread in the morning, a sign and a presence of the God who will make himself known who will deliver and save. This is the theophany to ancient Israel, the theophany to the present hungry world, the theophany that is felt by all who will like hungry Augustine long ago, take up the book, the holy book and read. Thank you. <laughs>